Hello and welcome everyone to the main event this week. I'm Meet Asani and I'm so pleased to be joined by Joellen Griffith. Hi Joellen, how are Hi. you? Hi, delighted to be back and talking about this topic yet again. I think yes. we could probably have a webinar a week and still be drilling down and drilling down. Yeah, well, this is definitely definitely core value stuff, isn't it? Yeah, yeah really and is core belief stuff which can often be fitted in you know or linked to our childhood so i'll do a little bit of housekeeping while everyone jumps in the room we are back on webinar jam which for some of you guys might not mean a lot you just click on the on the link and here we are but for <laughs> us um delivering to you we are in a, in a system that actually really helps us create a better experience for mm. you all so our events our webinars are mainly around 30 to 45 minutes. We try to keep them succinct. We know how busy everyone is. And we pick topics that really come from you in our conversations, in, in, in you know, for Joellen and I discussing what's going on out there. And we want you to be able to go away with, you know, in from this session with perhaps some clarity, understanding and tips to apply back in your world straight away. So that that's our mission, isn't it, for the 45 minutes, Joellen? Yes. And uh, it is, uh, I find it interesting that um, the topics do come out of what people need and what our experience is. It's also, yes. you know, oh, that touches. <laughs> yeah. So it's very personal as well. I, I think it's more than just, oh, this is a good topic to, to present to people. But yeah. because it's personal to us and we will have the experience, I think it makes it more real and, and people can connect more. Indeed. So the sessions are interactive. We very much want you to put your thoughts, comments, questions, anything into the chat box. We've got a really simple interface here. I'm just going to say a quick hello. There you are. You can see me saying hi. And that's as easy as it is. So please get involved. Give us your thoughts. Give us your questions. Um, alongside the chat box, we are running a poll. So if you haven't had a chance yet, as you've settled in, please have a look at our poll. Uh, again, Joellen and I, we're firm believers that our the impact uh, on us, the impact on organisations, the impact on supporting and managing people, it all stems from childhood. Yeah. And I just wanted to get a feel of the room to understand, you know, how did your parents parent you? guide you, drive you, challenge you. Um, I know for me, uh, well, quite interestingly, I put the poll in um, before Joellen joined the room because we discussed it. And I said to Joellen, so the, the question is in childhood, what did your parents put a high value on? Uh, my initial options were education, manners and independence. And then Joellen said, and money. And I thought, you know what, that was my one. Financial stability was the biggest driver and I didn't bring it. So there's definitely some subconscious stuff going on there. So our four are education, which actually is at 81% at the moment. Very interesting. Independence, manners and money. And there's a fifth one which says none of the above, they were easygoing. So it will be interesting to keep looking at the poll mm -hmm. during this session. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll um, uh, publish the results at the end to see what comes of it. But interesting stuff there. Joellen, what are your thoughts on that poll? I think it's a great poll because I, as, a, as a psychotherapist, as well as, as yes, uh, running a training yes. company, um, so pretty much everything, our behavior is, is fed by our childhood experiences. Yes. And I think for this topic, um, it's, it's really, it's where it stems from. But I also uh, want to talk about just briefly what goes back even before our childhood, <laughs> which yes. is, you know, the way we survived as a species. Human beings survived as a species by connecting yeah, being part of a tribe. And what you did is you adapted your behavior so you weren't thrown out of the tribe. And some of the most powerful punishments still are to not be included in the tribe. And okay. I think that our fear of failure or feeling an imposter is the fear of being thrown out of the tribe. So you combine that with the childhood messages 
Mm-hmm. And it's extremely powerful. And why we, as I said, we could talk about this every week and still not get to the bottom of it. It's also very personal. It's very individual, yeah. um, which is why your poll is great because it will, you can kind of say, ah, that's a trigger for me. Or yes, I am driven by that. I yeah. got that message when I was a child. Even if stuff isn't on your poll, um, mine was very much, it wasn't so much about being independent as um, I could take care of myself was the message I was given. So my thing was, I can't show vulnerability. I can't show that I need people. Um, so that because the message was, no, we don't have to worry about you, Ellen, because there were so many other children that yeah. they worried about. So it, it'd be great for the poll to trigger people's thinking as well. If, the, if their thing isn't on there, what else messages did they get that yeah. use present behavior? And if you have any that aren't on there, please add it to the chat box. Let us know. We can talk about it and bring some understanding to life about how, you know, a lot of people say, well, it was my childhood. There's nothing I can do with it. But if we can't change the childhood. We can understand it. And once we understand how it impacts us, we disempower it. Yeah. And all of a yeah. sudden we see the signs. And I'm speaking from experience of, I think I have um, a lot of imposter syndrome. Again, my, my, my whole thing was uh, one of four, a girl after three boys, parents who were very driven by education and money, not, not because of status, but because of survival. My, you know, my, my father came from poverty, you know, and so I've actually realized I carry his drivers instead of my own. So yeah. learning how to unpack that and then repack my own journey. Um, I'm looking forward to the next half an hour. It's going to be an interesting one. So why don't we start with what it is and how it manifests in people? Mm. But, I mean, if we were, um, ah, Kiki says God, and God, how can you, I said God, how can we ever, you know, how can we ever compete with God? How can we ever reach success of, of connecting, you know? Um, God can either be a very reassuring, supportive place we go, or it can be a fearful and never enough space we go. So again, yeah, thank you, Kiki. That's very interesting. Nice. So how would you say, Joe, well, I've got a stat for you actually to start with, which is that apparently something like, well, apparently everyone has felt imposter syndrome feeling themselves out at, at some time or another. Yeah. But apparently nearly 60% of people continue to have it in, as part of their challenge. And yes. that that's huge, isn't it? That's a lot of people. I actually think it's it's probably higher. Yeah. Uh, what I think is great and um, is that more and more people, famous people or celebrities are coming out and talking about their own vulnerability and their own sense of imposter syndrome. You, you pick up an article in the Radio Times or in a magazine or somewhere yeah. else and someone is talking about feeling an imposter. So in a way, that's very healthy because that is one of the ways to combat it is to talk about it. Yeah. And to acknowledge that you feel it, um, it is uh, it is the fear of being found out somehow. I mem- I remember, uh, you know, an analogy was uh, when I was a ther- when I had therapy practice, and someone said someone's going to fling open the door of my office in the days before open plan offices, and say, "Out! You've been found out." Yeah. And uh, so there is that somehow. Um, I don't have enough. I am not enough. My knowledge isn't enough. My skills aren't enough. And therefore, I will be found out and I'll be sent packing. Yeah. Uh, the tribe. And that tribe might be your business or your relationships or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be cast out and alone. And I think, as you said about our primal um, fears from, from, you know, it's about survival and safety and not being part of a pack not being part of something and not having that belonging is literally life or death yeah. so yes, yeah absolutely yeah and so they, those are the feelings that are now kind of manifesting in us but also quite interesting more women than men suffer from imposter syndrome yeah. of the 60 percent that continually feel it um 20 as uh, 25 percent are women only 10 percent are men um 
even though that doesn't add up to 100. So I'm no, they're just <laughs> trying to work that out. And oh, it sounds like my math brain. <laughs> it's also um, mainly millennials, which I thought was quite interesting. Oh, no, that is interesting. Yeah. So the age group that, that feel like frauds in the workplace are 25 to 39 year olds. So, so yeah. Nearly that hard. does surprise me. I, I sort of experience it as across the board. Um, so that think, that is interesting statistic. It is, and I tell you what else is quite interesting is that the the evolution of the way we work. You know, the hybrid working, the um, working from home when you may not have as much structure and as much availability of your managers and your team to demonstrate success. Uh, the way you're managed, all of this has shifted. And so I can imagine that, you know, I, I know for me, growing up being, you know, 10 to 15 years younger than all my siblings, I had to really do a lot of work to get noticed and to be praised, you know, and, and in a way that started out at work with sort of wanting to be noticed. Right. You know, so again, how we get feedback, working remotely in a room on your own isn't going to create that. So yeah. maybe that's why millennials are feeling it more now, because they are quite isolated. Yes, it, it's really would be uh, maybe we have to do another one to dig down because what one of the things when I talk when when we get to that point of what can we do is around building your resilience and mm -hmm. uh, you know at seventy five now um, I've had mm -hmm. a lot of practice building my resilience and maybe that is why it's a younger generation that hasn't yeah. had that or hasn't needed Feel that to build that resilience really yeah, tools, to the right? well and that reflects on the statistics because only three percent of those feeling uh or experiencing imposter syndrome are over 65 mm. so yeah. yeah very interesting you know so we have a question and uh, natasha asked do we think that imposter syndrome affects women more than men uh yes the stats say that and I think we've got to perhaps just spend a minute on why that might be. Well, I think that there are huge expectations often on um, girls. They are criticized more. I mean, that actually, when I was training as a therapist, girls tend to be, I mean, the classic, and we've heard this before, and I've said it before, if a boy does something that's leadership, if a girl does it, it's bossy. So um, there are higher expectations that you can juggle it all. You can have it all. Yeah. Um, so we're fed as females uh, a lot more garbage, mm. <laughs> not by our parents, by the media, by even our bosses will often expect more, give a little bit more leeway to the men. Um, well, we just look at the way leadership goes in, yeah. in this country and in America as well. So yeah. I think that there's a really strong foundation and that's what it is. The messages we get and the expectations are that we will be better and th that more is expected of us and that we have to do it really well. And mm -hmm. women will say, I have to work twice as hard to do to get just as much as the men. Um, women of color will say, I have to work twice as hard as that to um, level. to get up to a level. So it's a um, continual pressure that I don't think that men experience at the same level. Yeah. It's quite interesting because the way imposter syndrome will then manifest is that people won't go for promotions. Women over men yes. will not ask for the pay rise. We all know about the gender gap challenges. Yes. Even after 10 years of expected transparency, there remains a huge divide. Yes. Definitely some companies have done better than others. But as a as a as a trend, we, you know, we are not making this equality, uh, a, a, you know, a, a challenge of the past. We still yeah. face. So all of these feed back into imposters challenges and hence why women feel it more than men. So I guess, again, what we're saying is if you go back to childhood and you go back to the way and I have boys and girls, so I definitely notice in myself when I might not be equal in the way I treat my children and try to correct myself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes from learn and seen behavior from yes. the way my parents treated us as much as I feel like I was treated exactly like one of the boys by my parents. I think societal requirements impacted me more. Yeah. So there's so much going into it, isn't it? 
yeah. I mean, I was one, um, well, my parent, my father remarried and I lived with my father and stepmother for right. many years. And there were four girls and a boy. And I mean, it was clear right from the beginning, uh, you know, there was a college fund put aside for him, the, go, the golden for any of the rest of us. Yeah. Um, if we wanted to go to college, we had to find a way to make it happen ourselves. So it was just very interesting that it was he. We all loved him because he was such a sweetie. Yeah. But uh, it was so clear the um, the bias in a way. Yeah. yeah. And 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 as last time, we have had probably a third more sign-ups for today's session than some of our others. Yeah. Um, I've actually got a comment uh, from Natasha who says, "Interesting, you say about the gender pay gaps." as company is now required to publish a report on that topic, but not on the diversity of their workforce. Yes. You're absolutely right, Natasha, and we cover this in other webinars. Yeah. We, there is so much work to do. And, you know, if we can help people overcome imposter syndrome, hopefully they will find their voice where they can actually speak out about this. That's, the, that's the thing. Is It isn't just what's going, what happens to you internally. It, and and feeling better and more confident, but what you then do with it, because that was a big shift for me um, when I I remember being bullied in a job and just not putting up with it. And I think, you know, and, and the job I had before that, I was thrown, I was sacked for trying to bring a union in. So it was like, oh, that's wow. interesting. And I, I, I kind of just caved, um, but I had a voice, but it was like, mm -hmm. But in the next job, it was like, again, building up that thing of just, yeah. no, I'm not, I'm, and it's like, she backed off. And it was like, I was never bullied again in that. Mm -hmm. But I think that Natasha's point is really good. There is so far we have to go yeah. to get a balance of everything. Yeah. Uh, but that's why I say, you know, women of color have probably the biggest Hurdle. I mean, maybe I'm wrong to say this, but that's my experience, not as a, you know, obviously white, but that the hurdle is much higher for uh, women I, and women of color. Yeah, I, I've i been listening to, I was listening to LBC yesterday. Obviously, there was a lady who was, uh, who was asked to leave or resigned from Buckingham Palace because she approached uh, the CEO of a charity asking her where she was from. And all the response from people calling in you know there was uproar and there were some people that said you know what I just don't let it get to me and I know from growing up I had to I had to ignore that I was a girl with three other boys perhaps my parents helped me by not differentiating me but I carried that on into my workplace mm -hmm. where I didn't allow being a woman or being of color yeah I just told myself no you just you know, until it comes and trips you up, you you are an equal at the table. But it's hard. It's hard. It takes more energy to yes. do that. And I think that's that, that's the key here yeah. is that and carrying the whole imposter syndrome is just like another burden. So you've got what's externally coming at you by society, by prejudice, by bias. And then you've got your part of the equation, which is yeah. what's going on for you internally. So. Yeah. And actually looking at the topic today and having a real mix of business owners, people leaders, plus individuals who are coming on to watch, we're looking at this from two sides. And actually, I think it's important to understand what's going on from both sides. Yeah. So on one hand, we will look at the individual experience, the individual uh, way it manifests, you know, feeling like you're never going to be able to achieve what you want to achieve, feeling like you're not worthy of this promotion or that you are, as you said, going to be found out but the, the challenge of that is that wherever imposter syndrome exists for business and for management it's really key that they start to notice the traits of it they start and it is mental health it is a form of mental health and yes. we all talk about you know we, well, thank god that mental health is no longer a dirty word and we are talking about it more and actually the correction has gone from it being over there to now we're really talking about, we're not over talking, but we're making sure it's always on the agenda and, and, and considered as yeah. part of a conversation. But actually the impact of, ment of, of um, uh, the imposter syndrome yeah. will have anxiety, uh, will be you know depression, but also in terms of impacting people at work, 
it, it creates a level of procrastination. Uh, it translates into longer work. So 63% procrastinate. 57% will end up working longer hours. And there is a 44% increase in uh, turnover of staff yeah. who just think, okay, I've got to, yeah, I can't do it, I'm going. And a 41% loss of productivity. Um, that is, all of these are not small numbers. This is. No, so I mean, you know, when we, years and years ago, because Impact Factory is in its 33rd, 33rd year now. Amazing. And early on, we were uh, approached by a company who was losing people. And they were being promoted because they were really good at what they did. Um, and then they were promoted, not in a Peter principle, to their level of incompetence, but for their level of lack of training. And so that's when we put together a line management program that is still, all this time, our most popular course. And it is Brilliant. because someone is good and you think, great, they're great, they get on with their colleagues, let's just, they put them in and they're terrified. And yeah. that's when imposter syndrome, it comes up practically in every course that people will mention, I shouldn't have this job or I'm ill-equipped and, you know, I just want to go back and do what I did before. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, and we've also noticed a trend this year, not last year, but this year. So our open courses were all mm, uh, maybe 90, 85, 90% self-selected. Yeah. Now people are being sent and on oh, and on uh, line management, nearly everyone is being sent. Yeah. So it's it's a great way to combat that. But it still sits there where people will not have the careers they could or should have because of the feelings that hold them back. Yeah. And, you know, coaching is such a huge part of this because yeah. you're right, even in our world, in, in, in the recruitment and talent management world, many businesses will promote people that are good at doing the job. So good at going out, networking, finding great people, matching them with their clients, really understanding what makes people tick. Uh, uh, but in a in a in a in a career space, in a business requirement space, and then you think, well, I'm going to make them a manager of five of people like that. But understanding business and skills and fit is a very different skill set to understanding what makes people tick on the ground. And it's it's understanding the gap, and then it's identifying the training requirements, and then training and coaching, and 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 never assuming. And I think what you said about the company where people were put in the role and they just assumed. They could get on with the job is was was the downfall. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly, you know, you said your line management uh, uh, training session is, is the most popular. I think you know everyone should go back and revisit. And if you are in the receiving, you should, if you're in the receiving end of that where you've been put in a role, you know, oh, I'm in one of those rooms where the light goes out if I don't move for a long time. <laughs> well, you don't wave your arms. I'm going to have to step out of the photo for a minute now and uh, read to wave light. your arms about. Yes, yes, yes I've yes, tried yes. that one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there we go. Apologies. Yes, I'm, I'm, I look like I'm in a glitch in the matrix. The, 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 the program <laughs> from behind has gone, but I'm just in a separate meeting room today. Apologies. Um, yeah, I think that it, 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 if you are in a position where you feel that you want support, you need coaching, I, I always go on about the job description. I think it's a really important tool to understand your tasks, for you to do a gap analysis of where you are versus where you want to be or need to be. Take that to your manager and say, look, can we have a tool yes. of, you know, use this as our tool of measuring and managing success and then identifying the challenges. Don't wait for an appraisal. Take it to a weekly one-to-one. -one. If you don't get a weekly one-to-one, -one, ask for a period of time when you could have a session of weekly or bi-monthly sessions. You know, I think there are ways that you can coach yourself. I think one of the difficulties, I was looking at my notes that I I wrote before our session. And when, again, when you go back to the original, you know, fear of being out of the tribe and then all the other things that infuse our current behavior, yeah. If you suffer from imposter syndrome, you're also in that hyper vigilant state, not just that you're going to be found out, but what should I be doing? Am I doing this right? It's a fear of criticism. So you are in a constant level of fear, which, you know, hypes up your adrenaline 
And often you can't see or hear what's really going on. You're, I mean, I wrote down catastrophizing. Yeah. That often we're in a situation where we catastrophize. We look at the worst case scenario and we don't have a reality check on the best case scenarios. Could I tell you a story, which I think might be, uh, is a yes. great beginning of, of um, how, uh, again, things that we can do to combat it. Yeah. So um, one of our senior training consultants is a man named Paul Hughes. Now, Paul Hughes started his life as a football player. He played for Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was told when he was so frightened, oh, just fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. And we began unpicking in a, in a conversation a couple of weeks ago before a taster he was doing on confidence for us about how negative that is that the idea i already feel like a fake now you're telling me to fake it till i make it mm -hmm. but he was waiting to make his debut and he was in the, the wings <laughs> in, in the clubhouse yeah terrified and and i'm not going to be able to do this they've made a mistake um uh, you know and he said he had to talk himself down <laughs> yeah. uh, to a place where he he stopped catastrophizing and began looking at how did he get to the point where he was making his debut yeah. as one of the youngest players ever for Chelsea. Um, so what got him there as opposed to what's going to happen? Yeah. And what he realized is that he actually didn't have to fake it till he make it. He had the confidence. He just had got his brain had gone to all the negative yeah. to what was going to happen. And he is the youngest still, the youngest player that Chelsea has ever had who scored on his debut. Oh, amazing. And everything lifted him yeah. when he stopped catastrophizing that he shouldn't be there. Yeah. And it was such a lovely story, but also it's like uh, when I, when he said it, I said, you know, I think that's how I've operated, how I helped overcome yeah. my own sense of, I don't belong here. I shouldn't yeah. be doing this yeah. was actually, I, I've done it over there, or I was good at this, or I had a skill over here. Why would all of that suddenly disappear? Because mm -hmm. I'm putting the pressure on myself, not necessarily anyone else yeah you know it's interesting you use a footballer as the uh you know the analogy in that story because their physical ability is their success but it came from a mental place and for many of us we sit at a desk and the most physical we get is our voice and our fingers on a keyboard however if there is a disconnect between what you feel and what you do faking it till you make it the physiological impact on your health yeah. is also there. You will start to get aches. You will start to be short of breath. You will start to, um, you know, you'll get RSI quicker. It's and, and bigger issues as well. So, you know, it's important for your physical and mental well-being that if you are experiencing these uh, symptoms and, you know, Joel, and we, we, we've talked a lot about the background and, and, and you know, we, we've, I feel like we've covered we skimmed over a lot of the, um, the, the, the the topic, and I think I would love to make this the same one we cover this time next month. And you know, just digging down deeper. But yeah. you know, it's actually you've got no choice but to address it. And the best time would have been when you first noticed it. But when you first noticed it, you probably couldn't identify it. Yeah. The next best time is now. So I think our promise to you is that we will bring tools that are going to help you chip away at this. It's not a sort of switch you can flick. It right? isn't a quick fix. No. But there are small things. I mean, that's our one of our mottos: smallest yeah. change for the biggest impact. Small yeah. things that you can do, and one of them is is just what I've said. If you notice yourself catastrophizing, um, actually do that reality check. What is you created the word? And we're we're where again, our DNA is geared to look for the mastodon. So we do look for the worst case scenarios. Yeah. But we don't look at the best case scenarios. Mm -hmm. And I so just that's a really good starting point. Which is a great it? starting point. And yeah. what got you? Yeah. What 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 would what do you already have? Not what you need to have or not what you need to overcome, but what do you already have? Yeah. And there's also something that again, because of our vulnerability and our embarrassment and shame, which feeds 
so much of what we got from our childhood is that we don't talk about our failures. We might celebrate success or people around you will celebrate success, but we should be talking about our failures as well because it, it minimizes them. It, it makes them, um, they don't have such a grip on us. Yeah. And one of the things from the beginning at Impact Factory is I'm the first person to hold my hand up. I screwed up. Yeah. I did this. This didn't happen. I did that. We, there was one yesterday. It was not a major one, but I lay down to take a short nap. And I slept through dinner and the work that I was supposed to finish by the end of the day, I didn't get done. And so I just had to apologize to everyone and say, oh, this happened. So, um, uh, you know, that is the first thing to do. Yes. This is what happened. And it's the catastrophizing thing again, yeah. isn't it? What, what actually is going to happen? Because if it's a one off in a long line of success or, or you know, recognizing that something might be going on for the now. I think one of the challenges of uh, imposter syndrome is we don't have that rationality. And what I'd love to just cover are the, the, the five types. I'm sure there's more than five types. We could all find our unique type, but I'd love to cover the five types and how they manifest. Um, we've just had a message actually asking for the recording. Absolutely, we will get the recording out to you uh, probably by the end of play today. What we also uh, suggest is that if you know of anyone that also needs some of this support, please share it. We, we, we want to give as much support as we can. And uh, that means internally and individually, like people, you know, both in business, in your, in your working world and, and, and socially as well. Um, and watch this space for, for how we're going to dig down into this topic for the next session as well. Um, but there's five topic, there's five headings, if you like, for the way imposter syndrome can manifest. So we've got the perfectionist, the natural genius, the rugged individual or soloist, the expert and the superhero. So you just mentioned, Joellen, <laughs> about the perfection, you know, about, you know, delivering and expectation on yourself. And if you're not able to sort of say, hey, I messed up, that probably comes from being a perfectionist, right? Yeah. So the way but, yeah, but I mean, I think perfectionism probably is a is a through theme for all of them. Yeah. But I think it's nice to have them um, sort of distinguish so you can kind of say, yes, I'm a perfectionist and I'm also. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so traits of perfectionism, you know, high expectations, this all or nothing vibe if I've only done 99% but I've missed 1% well then it's like I've done nothing um constantly questioning yourself and actually I did some coaching with a member of the team who is a is a perfectionist if she hasn't done a 10 out of 10 day or a 10 out of 10 week then as far as she's concerned she's failed the whole week and we talked about well I talked about using the exercise analogy because I am actually that's my hardest area is getting into a rhythm and we talked about perceived rate of exertion and how actually they talk about you know when you should be doing nine and ten out of ten or when you know you should be doing six or seven and I said look at work you probably want to get an RPE of about eight you know this is a marathon not a sprint and you know, if you can achieve an eight, then you can sustain it for, for, for in, you know, an infinite time. And what does that look like? So instead of having a list of, you know, an ongoing to do list, why don't you put three things in every day, which actually over a week is 21 things or don't count the weekend, 15 things. <laughs> um, and then, you know, if you can bring forward some things, all of a sudden your perspective on your achievement is, hey, I'm ahead not behind. But if you keep your list of 15 things to do every day, you're never going to feel like you've achieved. And that will then feed into the imposter syndrome mindset. So I think time management is a really important thing yeah. because it becomes your it becomes your barometer and, and set yourselves realistic expectations and use a coach, use a team, use a colleague for that, you know, or do that with your manager in your one to one. Yeah, like that a lot. Even in social life, I think, uh, and this is a problem, isn't it? The way we are socially can impact on work in terms of in, in terms of uh, imposter syndrome and vice versa. So I think sometimes, you know, um, my perfectionism doesn't exist at work anymore. That I threw out a long time ago, but I'm more aware of it in my personal life, particularly around baking or cooking, and it's like. Yeah. <laughs> I've been cooking a long time and I'm yeah. 
pretty, I'm, I'm decent, but mm -hmm. it still will get me and I'll notice that and I'll think, why am I making such a fuss? It's either any good or it's not any yeah. good or it's somewhere in between. I did my best and, you know, well, there's always next time. It's really hard, isn't it, to, 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 to tell yourself It's that. catching it. It's catching it. Yeah. You know, when next, you the, next, the next one is na a natural genius. Um, you know, very much people having maybe been really good at education or being told that they're the smart one when growing up or and then all of a sudden expecting themselves to still be that person. I actually saw this in my son. In his junior school, he was captain of everything, top in class, and he went to a very high challenge school, high challenge, high support. But he went from being, you know, in his little area to national Olympians being in the sports team. So he went from captain to team A, sometimes team B. And I think for him, I think his imposter syndrome actually impacted where he didn't try as hard, mm. you know? And so, you know, I think it's important for people to remember that they're a work in progress. You have not reached your destination. You are continually improving, continually, you know, so maybe just work on things as and when they arise, rather than having that expectation of always knowing everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Go, oh, yep. Next one. Next one is the rugged individualist or socialist. Uh, or socialist. Socialist. <laughs> Could be a socialist too. <laughs> <laughs> Could be a socialist soloist. Somebody who thinks that they should be able to do it without help. You know, somebody that is independent, doesn't really want to ask for help, you know, doesn't doesn't feel like, you know, they by just asking for help shows them being at a, a at a deficit. And yeah, and that that links to the messages I got as a child, you're okay, you can take care of yourself. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, I can't. But because that was the message for a long time, yeah. I was the soloist, I could handle it, I could make, I could deal with everything, no problem. Um, and then I got really ill. And guess what? I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. And at that time, it's understanding that asking for help is actually a really strong sign of a good leader, a good team player. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no one can do it on their own, nobody, right? So it's, and it's testing the waters and asking for help and seeing what response you That's get, it. you know? And most people are really happy to help. Or my, again, my experience is if you say, oh, can I have, take five minutes of your time? Yeah, of course, no problem. Yeah. Um, but it took a lot for me to get to that point where I could admit that I needed help. Yeah. It, and again, I think if you're in a position of seniority, you would get so much buy-in by demonstrating that you need help from time to time, that actually sometimes, you know, one of your team will coach you because, you, you know, you're stuck on something. We're just all just trying our best, but we have, you know, barriers that get in the way. So if we can recognize them and demonstrate that we have found ways to fail and overcome, then that's even more of a great success story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The next one is being the expert. So a bit similar to the genius, but somebody who thinks that, you know, they have to be the, the, the one that knows it all, the one that has to, you know, have all the knowledge, have all the expertise, that if, if people aren't coming to you, then, you know, you're not important at all. You know, it, it, it's... Um, These are the types, not... I mean, listen, we get all the types on our courses, but often people have, think, think that they have to know it all. So it is, it's, and when they come on court, they've been promoted to line manager, it's like, well, now what do I do? Oh, I should know what I'm supposed to do. And so I think that that um, is a perfect link about yeah. being the expert. I'm supposed to know it all. Yeah. And also understanding that your knowledge um, is exceptional, you know, not yeah. don't, don't turn yourself into wallpaper. Yeah. You think yeah. because you know something that everybody knows that, but they don't. So, you know, don't undersell yourself. Make sure that you, you know, you are your biggest supporter and you are your biggest brand manager. Make sure that you, you do yourself justice when you're out there, you know. Um, and the final one is the, the superhero. It's always staying late, no work-life balance, experiencing a lot of stress, maybe a workaholic. Have you seen those in your workplace, Jo Ellen? Uh, we have someone who has the week off. And on Monday, and I was taking, I was being her. I said, 
you're reading your emails. And she sort of was like, ooh. And I said, the least you could do is mark them as, unre as unread. So I didn't know that you were looking at your emails. Yeah. We had a laugh about it, but it was just like, why? Uh, you know, I can handle your work. That's why you have a week off so you can do whatever you need to do to prepare mm -hmm. for Christmas or whatever, you know, was yeah. going on. But it was just like, don't do that. No. <laughs> and, you know, some people, again, you know, from childhood, they will have all different dynamics that means that they have to do more to show yeah. their value. I think that was definitely one for me. Yeah. Um, but also sometimes organizations can create a culture where there's a presenteeism is a big issue and people think they have to you know work to show their worth and their value we worked for a company and i won't say who it is it's a large advertising agency and we were working with the marketing team of this and they had a thing where nobody could be seen as the first one to leave and it was just like this is insane so mm. they would all stay late and not even necessarily stopping for no, yeah. at a certain point. Yeah. yeah, for no value in the work that yeah. they're doing. Yeah, it's just extraordinary. And yeah. then we just said only one of you has to leave first, yeah. and then yeah. you know. And so they changed. They w w that's why we were hired to help them change the culture. And that was I said that's a really simple one you can do tomorrow. Yeah. You just leave early. And, and the chances are that there was somebody with imposter syndrome with the work with the superhero attitude as their strongest, and as a result, all of a sudden everyone yep. follows. Yep. So it just shows the power or yep. the impact of these these traits and, and these feelings, which sometimes we don't even realize that yep. they, they you know they, yep. they, 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 they don't serve us. Yeah, absolutely. So let's think about solutions. We talked a little bit about solutions. Um, on the individual type, but Joanna, what would you, you know, if you, if you in your psychotherapy, but also in your work, work as a business owner and a people leader, how would you recommend that people look at this? Let's start with on an, on an individual basis. Let's sum up. Well, on an individual basis, and I might plug something if you don't mind. Yes. I think I, one of the things I realize is how much I'm driven by purpose and how much purpose is, is important to me. And that has helped me overcome quite a bit yeah and we're actually running a taster next week on purpose so if you don't mind me putting the link sure um in because if you can begin to uh, to um understand your purpose and know that that's your safe hey just that's your safe place so that you you start looking at does what i'm doing align with my purpose yeah and I think that having a strong sense of value and sense of purpose in the world helps diminish. It really, really made a huge difference. And we're talking about long before Impact Factory. Yeah. Did, I, did I begin to, I didn't have the word purpose, but once I did, maybe about 40 years ago, it it's was like, yeah, that actually really, really helped me overcome yeah. my sense of being a failure, not being good enough, all of that stuff was, I had something that was greater than me. I've gone again. I've gone again. Lave your arms again. <laughs> so that, that actually to me is when you have a sense of purpose that is something greater than yourself, that will help you with the disconnect between the reality and, and the fantasies that you make up or the catastrophizing. Yeah. So that's one thing. One, I did this, I think, on the original one we did. I, can't, I, I think I did which is I have a reminder. Oh, yes. And I'm going to show it again. This is a reminder of who I came out of. You know, this is, I think, when I was about six, seven weeks old. Yeah. Boy, Untainted. I'm having a happy baby picture that yeah. is right there where I can see her, and I do sometimes think of her as separate from me, um, is great. I, I also think having something that makes you smile around your desk, you know, people used to have pictures of their family and things mm -hmm. that is a symbol of your success. Yeah. These are all small things. You don't have to tackle necessarily the big, huge emotional issues, yeah. which we can look at in more in depth the next session. We will. Yeah. yeah. It's a reminder that we, you have that place to go back to. And when you're noticing reactions or behaviors that are not healthy, that there is a way back from that to where you were in your yep. purest form, yep. which will serve you the best. It's interesting. You talk about purpose. I talk about in my other webinars and stuff and um, 
finding your voice. Yes. So again, yeah. I was all hooked into my dad's voice until I lost him and then I had to find my voice. So however you do that, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to sum up for today. But however you start on that journey, you know, know that as Joellen said, put your baby picture there. Know you can get back to that. That person is inside you. Yes. There's just a bit of a maze to get there, but we can work <laughs> on that together. So thank you so much for your contribution to the poll as well. The top uh, response was 68% education, 26% manners, 5% of you had really easygoing parents. We had none for independence or money. So oh, interesting right. stuff. I'm going to end that poll and publish those results, but we will use some of that feedback to give us some focuses going forward, one, yeah. going forward. So please do sign up. And Joellen, thank you so much for your knowledge, your expertise, your honesty, your authenticity. It really just makes this such a valuable and interesting session. And I love working with you and talking to you because we just, I think we're just so much on the same wavelength and this is such a crucial subject. It is. If we can do anything to help someone just make that, those tiny steps to feel, yeah. oh, yes, better. It's great. Let's do it. Thank you everyone for signing up, for joining today, for your, for your insights, your feedback, sharing on the chat box. And we shall see you back here next Thursday for more main event. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.